Okay, so today we're happy to have Sekou Chibukula from UC San Diego, who will tell us about massive spin two scattering. Thanks, John, and thanks everybody for uh, for showing up. Uh, Elizabeth sends her her regrets for not being able to join us, and of course, I'm sure we all would have preferred to have our our um, seminars in person. But uh, so um, as uh, John said, I'm going to talk about um, scattering of massive spin two states. Um, let me set the stage for why we started doing this, although I won't actually talk about this. I mean, we uh, were interested in looking at models of dark matter. Uh, in particular, we were interested in considering models of dark matter with uh, spin two mediators. Um, so the idea, of course, is there's some, maybe some Randall syndrome KK state that's a spin two mediator that couples to some potential dark matter particle. We were interested in understanding what kinds of constraints uh, there would be on such models. So, you know, everyone, uh, I'm sure everyone there is familiar with the, the basic randall syndrome model. So you have this kind of a, a geometry, a non-factorizable geometry where you have a scale factor that depends on the, on the location and some compact fifth dimension, but the transverse dimension, transverse four dimensions are, you know, Lorentz invariant. And, and we supposedly sit over here on the on the TEV brain, and all of our states are localized over here, whereas gravity is is uh, is is over there. And so, uh, in addition to the the massless graviton in those theories, you have massive spin two states, the Kaluza Klein tower, uh, and the Kaluza Klein tower couples to standard model and dark matter particles proportional to you know, couplings to the stress energy tensor. Um, we were not the first, of course, to think about these. So here's some recent work by Nuria Ruiz and, and company on sort of uh, graviton-mediated dark matter through KK gravitons. And you'll see that we're already sort of being constrained to higher and higher masses. So we're getting to, we're getting to the region of parameter space where the, the dark matter particles and the KK gravitons are all comparable in mass, and their masses are getting pushed higher and higher. So in order to get tooled up to this, we started sort of thinking about, well, what does this theory look like? What is the, the low energy theory of massive spin two particles, in particular, a KK tower of massive spin two particles in the Randall, Randall syndrome model? What does it look like? You know, what does scattering amplitudes look like? What would we expect for the cutoffs in such a theory? And, and what's the physics of what's going on? And so that's really the motivation for what we did. And I'm not going to get back to the dark matter because we haven't gotten back to, to really applying our results to that. But I, I think we have some nice results on the properties of what um, scattering amplitudes and, and the behavior of low energy effective field theory looks like uh, with uh, massive spin two particles. I should say that um, with this mode that I'm using, this presenter mode, I can't actually see anyone. So John, if if anyone has a question or you know, just go ahead and jump in and and yeah, let me know, and I'm happy to we, talk. We just shout when we have questions. Okay, no problem. Okay, so so this is really what I'm going to be talking about is the scattering amplitudes of massive spin two particles. This actually has a fairly long uh, history. There's a long literature about this, and so this is sort of my one slide summary of uh, sort of what the what the state of the art was before our work and uh, about, about these things. So first of all, it has a really long history. If you think about four dimensional spin two particles with mass that goes back to Fiertz and Pauli in 1939. So almost uh, you know, 80 years ago. Um, it, it turns out massive spin two particles are really quite different. If you think about trying to go to the massless limit, suppose you take a massive spin two particle, a massive spin two particle has five polarization degrees of freedom. In addition to the plus and minus two helicities, it has a plus and minus one helicity and a zero helicity. If you take the mass to zero just naively, what you find is uh, you don't actually recover Einstein gravity in that limit. And the reason you don't recover it is the, the helicity zero particle, though its mass goes to zero as the, uh, as the overall mass of the, of the spin two particle goes to zero, it couples to the trace of the energy momentum tensor. It doesn't decouple. So uh, if you just naively take the mass goes to zero limit of a, uh, of a theory with a massive spin two particle, uh, you, you'll find out you actually get, uh, you know, Brands-Dickey theory. You don't, you don't get, you don't recover Einstein uh, 
uh, gravity in that limit. There's a lot of other things that can be said about that. Uh, Akadi Weinstein argued that that is, uh, if you look at a, at a classical solution around a, a massive particle, that there's actually screening that happens and that at long distances you still recover uh, Einstein gravity. But that's, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's one indication of how things are really going to be uh, different for massive spin two particles. Um, our, uh, the, the discussion of scattering amplitudes and the behavior of the effective theory uh, in many ways started with this old paper of, not so old, I guess, 20 years old almost, of, um, you know, Nima and Howard and, and Matt Schwartz, where they um, tried to, where they did actually construct sort of the, the analog of the chiral Lagrangian to try to do an analysis of the effective field theory for massive spin two particles. And, um, what, what essentially happens is just like in a, a particle, in a, in a massive Yang-Mills theory where the longitudinal modes of the, of the vector bosons at high energies uh, have polarization vectors which are proportional to one factor of the momentum. Well, in a spin two theory, a massive spin two theory, what happens is there's the, the helicity zero mode at high energies. Uh, its its uh, polarization amplitude actually uh, behaves like it has you know two powers of momentum. So one way of saying that is in the if you want in the Stuckelberg formalism where you would uh, trade the longitudinal mode say for a massive vector boson for a derivative on a of a scalar a Goldstone boson. If you think about the analog in uh, gravity, the the spin zero helicity in a massive um, a, in a theory with a massive spin two particle behaves like a, 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 a scalar, but with two derivatives in it. So that changes the power counting uh, considerably. And, the, and of course, what suppresses those uh, powers of momentum and the helicity amplitudes are actually the mass of the spin two particle itself. So I'll say a little bit more about this on the next, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the next few slides, but roughly speaking, uh, what you can show using uh, an effective field theory analysis by just doing power counting um, is that the uh, elastic scattering amplitude of helicity zero uh, spin two particles would generically in, 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 in a generic theory grow, grow like energy to the tenth. So the idea is that you have um, a, uh, you know, Einstein Hilbert gravity is the kinetic energy piece if you want for your uh, spin two particle, and you just add a, a Fiertz poly mass term. It turns out for a spin two particle, there are different kinds of mass terms you can add. Um, this this decomposition tells you that your massive spin two particle acts like uh, each one acts like an object with two derivatives. So if you're not careful, if you write down a mass term, uh, you'll end up with a theory that effectively behaves like it has four time derivatives in it. So it suffers from the uh, Ostrogradsky instability of classical mechanics. And there's one linear combination uh, of those sort of two mass terms, h mu nu squared and the trace of h mu nu quantity squared. There's one linear combination where the four time derivative terms drop out. And that's exactly the combination that Fiertz and Pauli, they, they saw that there was a ghost there. And Fiertz, that's what Fiertz and Pauli suggested had to be the, the mass term. So if you just start with, um, Einstein gravity for the kinetic energy term for your spin two fields and you perturb around flat space and you uh, add a Fiertz Pauli like mass term, you will find that the scattering amplitudes typ typically go like energy to the 10th power. So uh, since you know, these, the relevant dimensionless scattering amplitudes, or the relevant scattering amplitudes are dimensionless, there's only two powers of M Planck that come from the couplings. And so uh, the, there's an inverse um, uh, dependence on, you know, of the mass, on the mass of the particle itself, M, M uh, mass to the eighth power. And so the cutoff is much, much lower than the Planck scale typically. If you have a particle uh, that's light by comparison to the Planck scale, the cutoff will instead be the 10th root of this factor um, here. Unlike the case of Yang-Mills, and this is something that uh, Nima, Howard, and, and Matt pointed out, um, with a, with a um, spin two particle, you can add additional non-derivative terms. The mass term is a quadratic term. You can add, add cubic non-derivative terms involving uh, the, the perturbation, the spin two perturbation, you can add uh, quartic terms. And those cubic and quartic terms can actually be used to cancel some of the growth. So if you adjust uh, 
the cubic and quartic terms uh, correctly, you can uh, reduce the bad high energy behavior from energy to the 10th power down to energy to the sixth. So that's one of the points at which it differs from, uh, from Yang Mills theory. In fact, what you're doing there, it turns out is, and this was pointed out by Duram and Gavadadze, what you're doing is you're adding, uh, just like I said here, the, the mass term was, was tuned to, uh, to avoid effectively uh, behaving like a, a term with, uh, so even though it's a mass term for the spin two particle, when you rewrite it in terms of the, the, the Goldstone boson you want, the, 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 if you want the piece that's eaten by the helicity zero mode, it, uh, you add two derivatives. So these mass terms were tuned to not have four time derivatives in them. It turns out the, the, um, the cubic and the quartic terms you write down are precisely the terms where even those terms don't have four time derivatives in it. So um, uh, they found a systematic way of writing down, at least at the classical level, higher and higher order terms uh, that don't have the Ostrogradsky instability. Um, but it turns out that beyond the quartic order, it doesn't, doesn't help. And uh, they, uh, again, verified that the scattering amplitudes, or they, I, actually, I don't think they explicitly verified it, but they argued that those scattering amplitudes should grow only like energy to the sixth. More recently, last year, uh, um, Bonificio and Hinterbeckler showed, uh, Hinterbeckler showed that uh, you can't add extra scalars or vectors. That doesn't help to, uh, to cure the bad high energy growth of a theory with um, uh, massive spin two particles. So of course, our theory is not just a four dimensional theory with a massive spin two particle. The theory we were interested in actually was a theory with a whole kaluza klein tower of spin two particles. And so we wanted to understand what happened to the scattering amplitudes of uh, the KK modes, massive spin two particles that arise from these compactified theories. Um, in, in, a, in a consistent compactified theory. So this would be one way of sort of understanding the uh, validity of the effective uh, field theory. Can I so, ask a question? Yeah. Uh, sure. So the, this e to the six behavior is not unique. Yeah, so you can add different things which still have e to the six. It's not that there is only one uh, potential that you can have. There's one linear combination. If I, 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 if I remember correctly, there's one linear combination at at uh, trilinear order, one linear combination at, at quadrilinear order that does this. So it is, it's a unique classical deformation, if I remember correctly. There may be some deformations that are irrelevant to it, but. Right, so, uh, so are there terms which are automatically e to the six or not? Because this adding scalars and vectors doesn't help means that it's still e to the six or it, does it make it more? Right. No, adding scalars and vectors doesn't change this e to the sixth. Did I answer your question? I'm not sure. Okay. Yep. Okay, just to remind you, um, uh, what, you know, the, the number of degrees of freedom for spin two particles in D dimensions, uh, you know, you have, this is, this is the infinitesimal general covariance or diffeomorphism invariance. So, you know, massless 4D graviton has two degrees of freedom, a massless 5D graviton has five degrees of freedom. A mass if four dimensional graviton has five degrees of freedom. So you can see how the, the, the degree counting works that the number of degrees of freedom at, at least at the massive level at, at, at each, uh, at each KK level, the, the five massive degrees of freedom, which come from compactifying a massless five dimensional graviton gives you exactly the five degrees of freedom you need for a massive spin two particle in four dimensions. And you, the, here's the Fiertz Pauli term. This is the term explicitly uh, that um, you know, avoids the Ostrogradsky instability that doesn't have a ghost. And this is exactly the combination that comes out when you compactify five dimensional gravity and you work out what the Kaluza Klein masses look like, they actually look exactly like this. So in principle, we have all the, the uh, ingredients and we'd like to now understand what scattering of these massive states uh, looks like. So um, I'm just using the four dimensional language. Everything goes through similarly in five dimensions, right? You, at least at the kinetic energy level, you start with the, 
Einstein-Hilbert action. Uh, you know, here's what the what the uh, Ricci scalar is. This is the trace of the Ricci scalar. These are the Christoffel symbols. You perturb around uh, whatever space you're interested in. I've written it here as a perturbation around flat Minkowski space. Of course, when we go to RS, we'll have to perturb around the around the uh, RS background metric. And then you uh, you have to compute um, all of the you, you compute in perturbation theory, essentially in powers of the coupling constant kappa. You compute all of the different couplings that you that you get. And the problem that you run into is when you start looking at the triple graviton vertex. I mean, this is this is this is the first time it was written down in 1967 by by Dewitt. But uh, and I think there's a there's a typo somewhere here in this one of these lines. But um, this just gives you a sense of if you're not careful and you're not um, uh, 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 smart about the way you organize your calculation, uh, the algebra very, very quickly gets away from you. And this is just for a single mode. Of course, in our case, we're going to have multiple KK modes, each of which have uh, interaction terms whose kinematic factors look like this. And we have to put, paste them together with um, uh, four ver you know, uh, quartic vertex terms. And we're going to have to do a calculation ultimately involving uh, all, of, all of that. So uh, just to, to talk about the helicity states, um, you know, you can use the usual kind of, this is just generalizing the, the vector notation. You have initial states, you have final states, you have um, uh, polarization vectors that are, that are uh, you, you can write them in terms of the polarization vectors for vector particles. Here are the spin one vector particles, uh, basically products of these um, end up being the spin two states. Products of the of a of spin one of spin zero give you the spin one states in a massive uh, spin two particle, and then the longitudinal state is sort of this combination of these uh, spin one states, and then you have all of the propagators, and you have the the um, in the usual sort of Mandelstam variable. So when I said energy to the tenth, I was actually talking about center of mass energy to the tenth. So if you just were to naively do the power canning by looking at the, 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 the propagator and the vertices and the polarization vectors, you would actually see that you would initially expect um, these sorts of interactions all actually go to go like energy to the 14th power. Part of that is because of the bad high energy behavior of the propagator. The propagator actually grows like momentum squared naively because it has two powers of these polarization vectors over P squared. Each polarization tensor is proportional to two powers of momentum. So unlike the spin one case or uh, um, uh, where it goes like a constant or a massive spin one case or the spin zero case where it falls, naively the propagator for a massive spin two particle actually grows with energy. So these diagrams, if you just compute, say, you know, associate two powers of momentum with each outgoing state for the polarization vector, two powers for the vertices and two powers for the propagator, you'll actually find that it goes like energy to the, to the 14th. But just like in Yang-Mills theory where the, um, the residual, uh, gauge invariance of uh, the theory actually softens the high energy behavior. The residual diffeomorphism invariance of the Einstein-Hilbert action is what allows this to en end up becoming uh, energy to the 10th uh, at, uh, at once you add all of these. And this one is actually just naively energy to the 10th. So if you just add a mass to a 40 graviton and compute, uh, and this was to the best of my knowledge, the first explicit computation of this was done by uh, Chung and Remen in, uh, in, two in 2016. Uh, when you actually just compute, for this means this and uh, the longitudinal, the helicity zero rather, the scalar helicity uh, combination of the massive particle that you're computing the scattering amplitude for, you find this behavior, it goes like energy to the 10th. And here, I think it was, was it Da who asked the question? I'm not sure who asked the question, but here are the nonlinear three-point terms to moderate the divergence. So now here is an answer to your question. Uh, as long as this linear combination ends up being one, you can cancel this energy to the tenth. I haven't written it down. There's an analogous combination. You have to uh, you have to cancel for energy to the eighth, and what you're left with is energy to the sixth when things are done. So this is what happens just in in massive gravity. And what we need to do is generalize this and understand what's going to happen in compactified gravity. So let me let me stop to see if there are 
if anyone has a question. I do have a question. Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, you're getting um, uh, more energy uh, violation or more powers in the energy when you add more propagators. So if you have, uh, say, uh, uh, like uh, a next to leading order, next next to leading order, for example, right. you can essentially uh, reduce the unitarity violating scale arbitrarily low, which indicates that there's something sick with the behavior. There is absolutely, I agree with you, there's something sick with the behavior. As we'll see, this is moderated substantially and almost completely in a, in a Kluge-Klein theory. Another way of seeing what the problem is, right, is your, your ultraviolet scale is depending on an infrared quantity, right? It's depending on the, the mass of the, of, the, of the object that you've introduced. So there's clearly something wrong here. And uh, this is the story as far as four-dimensional gravity with just adding a mass. That this is the best that, that we can do is get to energy to the sixth. But what I want to show you is the situation changes considerably when we have a, a higher dimensional theory that's compactified. I also have a question. Uh, it's, uh, it's more about IR than UV here, so maybe it's irrelevant uh, for your discussion. But uh, there is the Weinberg's theorem for the soft limit of uh, the, the graviton amplitudes. And now considering right. that your massive derivative in 4D is related to massless in 5D, are, is there any interesting soft theorem in 4D for massive gravity which would follow from the 5D massless? I think there's just Weinberg's theorem that, I mean, all that Weinberg's theorem uh, shows, right, is that the transverse polarizations have to couple to the energy momentum tensor. And that's still true here. What's different about massive gravity is you have the different, that extra polarization, the helicity zero mode, which couples to the trace. And that wasn't something that, I don't believe Weinberg's theorem speaks to that. I don't remember, I know if anyone else knows, but I don't, my recollection of it was, was explicitly looking at the transverse polarizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so the situation has to be different in the compactified theory. Um, and here's sort of, the, here's the Einstein-Hilbert theory in, in Lagrangian in five dimensions. It depends on some five-dimensional Planck, uh, Planck's constant because of power counting that goes like one over M5 cubed. If you didn't have any compactification, you'd expect that the properly normalized um, scattering amplitude should go like energy cubed. It's kind of interesting. It's an odd power of energy, but we understand where that comes from. I'll talk about that in a minute. But it certainly can't go like energy to the tenth. So, so what actually happens when you when you work in a compactified theory? So that's that's what we, what we want to consider. And this actually, um, John will remember this. This is something uh, Hong John, Her, Dwayne Dykus, and I worked out in an analogous case. And that's the case of Yang Mills. So I just want to remind you what happens in Yang Mills, and then I'll, we'll contrast that with what happens in, uh, in a theory with spin two particles. So if you have a Yang Mills theory that you compactify, say a five dimensional Yang Mills theory, you compactify down to four with some compact dimension. I've written it as a, you know, as a toroidal model, maybe with a orbifold projection. Then um, if you just expand the, the gauge bosons, uh, the five dimensional gauge bosons into eigenmodes of the, of the toroidal uh, uh, space, this is what happens to the, the four spatial components and the fifth component of the gauge field because of the, it, it has a different uh, parity under the orbifold uh, uh, um, uh, reflection uh, is a, basically a sine uh, Fourier expansion instead of a cosine one. And when you look at the FMN squared, uh, the kinetic energy term in five dimensions, you can sort of clearly see what happens when you decompose the gauge, um, uh, the, the uh, yeah, the uh, gauge field strength squared in five dimensions, you find that you have these sorts of interactions that are that, that sort of tell you what's going on. Basically, these modes of the fifth dimension become the Goldstone bosons that are eaten by the longitudinal modes of the massive KK states. So you end up with a tower of massive KK states as well as a massless one in general. Uh, and then uh, the these modes are entirely unphysical. You can always go, for example, to A5 equals zero gauge. A5 equals zero gauge is the analog of unitary gauge where all of these states become uh, eaten by the, the longitudinal gauge bosons. So now you can just do the computation. Naively, um, as you all remember from 
from electroweak theory, if you just compute um, the scattering amplitude of massive spin one particles using the sort of yang mill self interactions that you have, uh, naively diagram by diagram, uh, they grow like energy to the fourth. Energy here uh, is, is labeled by this, this uh, X. What happens in the Kaluza Klein state, say you, you consider a scattering of two Kaluza Klein states at level N, uh, because we've chosen for the simplicity to use a, a toroidal compactification, there's a KK momentum conservation, at least a discrete KK momentum conservation. So you can um, have exchange. I've only written the S channel exchange, but there's ST and U channel exchange of level 2N. And there's also the massless gauge boson that can be exchanged in those, in, in those channels. And when you add uh, just the, the theories, the, just the, uh, the amounts coming from the, uh, from the, um, uh, the, the Yang-Mills theory, you find that the energy to the fourth cancels. Well, that's not so pr surprising. That actually happens even in four dimensions. But you find that the energy squared terms also cancel, which was reassuring because your fundamental Yang-Mills theory, the five-dimensional Yang-Mills theory, didn't have a bad high energy behavior and compactifying it on a torus hasn't changed it. And what's happened is that what you would naively, you know, in, in the analog of say SU2 cross U1, you would have had the zero mode piece and you would have had the contact piece. But what's happening is in some sense, the longitudinal modes of these uh, higher states are coming in to unitarize the bad high energy scattering that would have been there uh, otherwise. So what would it, the, it's the longitudinal uh, pieces of these higher KK states that play the, the analog of the, the Higgs boson today in the electroweak theory. But this also tells you that you can never truncate your tower. At some levels, scattering at level n requires 2n, states at level 2n, but scattering 2n with n would require 3n, et cetera. There's no way to, to, uh, to, um, to truncate that, that theory. You need an infinite set of states. So we can do the same thing in gravity. Um, so for the moment, uh, although we're interested in RS, let me first do the toroidal case because it's, it's simpler. Uh, so the, the metric perturbation I can divide into a tensorial piece, uh, a gravophoton sort of a vector piece, and a, a, a radion piece, a, a 5 5 piece. Um, if we again do an orbital projection to, um, uh, we, we eliminate these states completely because these are odd, odd under the, under the orbital projection, whereas these states are even. Under, uh, under the orbital projection. So you can, uh, and, and that tells you that you can analyze scattering without, you know, in a, in a special case where you don't have a gravophoton state. Uh, but if you didn't do the orbital projection, in general, you have to include these states as well. Uh, so the theory that we have, a compactified theory of five dimensional gravity on a, on a torus, has, uh, it, we expect is gonna have a, a tower of spin two massive states corresponding to the tensorial part of uh, perturbations of the, of the metric and so a scalar state corresponding, the analog of the radion corresponding, if you want to something like the size of the extra dimension, it's related to it. Uh, that, uh, and we expect to have massless spin two states associated with this and massless spin zero states associated with that. And we now like to consider or we'll compute scattering of the massive spin two states, including all of the extra states to see what the, uh, uh, what the scattering amplitudes look like. Um, so what, whoops, sorry. Um, so we're interested in looking at the high energy limit. Uh, if we look at five dimensional gravity, what we expect is that the theory should go like the energy cube because the fundamental uh, massive, massive parameter in the theory is just one over the Planck mass cubed in five dimensions. And the way that we expect that that's going to show up in our four dimensional theory is that the uh, explicit scattering amplitudes, sorry, the exclusive scattering amplitudes will each individually grow like S. And uh, what happens in a typical you know, a KK theory is that as you have more and more states, there are uh, uh, states in your Hilbert space that are linear combinations of these KK modes, and they grow uh, with an extra factor, which is essentially the number of modes that you, uh, that you, uh, that you have. So what we expect is when we do the computation, we're actually going to find, we're going to actually do an exclusive computation, level n, level n, spin two scattering to level n, level n. We actually expect this to go only like one power of s. This would come about when we consider the entire KK tower. And we want to understand why, unlike uh, what happens when you just have 
five, massive 4D gravity where you, your naive expectation is S to the fifth. So somehow there has to be cancellations hidden inside the KK theory, which take you down from S to the fifth or energy to the 10th down to order S or energy squared. Uh, so that's, that's the computation that we're going to do. And so we'll do it for the torus. It uh, proceeds, at least in outline, very much like the, the Yang-Mills case. Again, because of discrete KK momentum conservation, the only intermediate states that, uh, that contribute, if you're doing uh, elastic scattering for level N, level N, going to level N, level N, are uh, exchange of modes at level 2N because of, of KK momentum conservation, or exchange, exchange of modes at level zero, which are the graviton, or just the four uh, contact term. Plus now, because there's one additional state here, oh, I should say, uh, I, should, I, I missed something here. Naively, you would expect that the, the radion would have an entire tower of KK states. There'd be a massless mode at level zero, and because there's dependence on, uh, on Y, you'd naively expect that there should be a, a tower. You can show, though, that you can fix a gauge so that the radion, um, this, this term, if you choose a particular gauge, this term has, uh, you can choose it, you can choose H55 to have no Y dependence. So the only uh, physical state here is a single uh, massless scalar particle, a single spin two vector, uh, sorry, uh, tensor particle, and then you have the KK tower of massive spin two states. Uh, that's, that's not obvious, but it, it, it's a, the analog of going to A5 equals zero gauge, but in the gravitational case. So, um, uh, so you have these uh, states that, that contribute as well as the radion. So you uh, find a, a graduate student who's really good at uh, Mathematica and willing to work on streamlining the calculation in such a way that it's actually doable. And when they work on it, this is what they come back with. Uh, here I've uh, looked at the, here's the, um, this is the uh, contribution to the matrix element coming from the four point interaction. Here's the contribution coming from the exchange of states at level two N. Here's the contribution coming from the massless uh, graviton. Here's the contribution coming from the radion. You, uh, we've expanded these um, uh, matrix elements uh, in, a, in, a, in, in powers of uh, leading powers of energy. So we have an energy to the 10th term and energy to the eighth and energy to the sixth. Uh, and then uh, energy to the fourth. And then you look at the sum and what you find is that lo and behold, uh, there are cancellations that occur between level zero, level two N and the contact interactions, which together um, actually eliminate the energy to the 10th growth and the energy to the eighth growth. But they're not enough to, to, to eliminate the energy to the sixth or the energy to the fourth. And here you need the radion. And what I've tried to show you here by including the angular dependence of each of these uh, contributions is that these cancellations really are, are highly non-trivial, right? Here's the cancellation. Here are the different contributions in, uh, here's the angular dependence rather of the different contributions uh, throughout uh, uh, phase space. And the radion diagram um, starts contributing only at order S cubed, but the radion contribution is crucial. Without the radion, you would not get the, um, uh, the cancellation of energy to the sixth or at, at, at energy to the fourth. Um, I should say that uh, if you look carefully at Matt's paper on um, deconstructing dimensions, there's an appendix in which he argues that, uh, that for a toroidal non-orbifold, but a toroidal decomposition, he argues that the energy to the 10th and energy to the eighth uh, contributions cancel. So uh, this reproduces uh, his expectation in that, in that case. Uh, he didn't include in his model the radion or any states like the radion, uh, but you see that those are crucial to see that the energy to the sixth and the energy to the fourth terms cancel. So now we have to see what happens in the randall sundrum model, but again, let me, uh, can I let just, me pause. Sorry, can I just ask a question before you go on? Um, Please. How, 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 does this, how does this jive with the result that you quoted at the beginning saying that adding vectors and scalars doesn't help? It seems like here because you it's are... Extra spin two particles instead. Oh, you're, so here, here, here the cancellation. So if they had done it with additional spin two, they would have discovered that this cancellation was possible. Conceivably, yes. With, yeah. Yes, that's possible. Okay. 
Yeah. But I mean, you could. But it's this. This is you happening. need both the extras. Go ahead. So, so if you didn't have the whole KK tower and you were just interested in some particular n mode, say I don't know n equals one or something, there's just one extra spin two guy, one vector and one scalar. Yeah. Uh, hold that thought. Um, I'll come back to that because okay. you're absolutely right, Marcus. The question is, right? What is the spacing? Right? Could you imagine a situation in which uh, this, at least looking at these results by themselves, doesn't tell you. Could you imagine a situation in which, uh, a, a, you know, to again, exactly like the Higgs list models that John and, and Chaba and, and company uh, constructed, where you tried to increase the spacing between the lightest mode and the next mode? Let, let me return to that question. It turns out the situation's different here, but, but uh, that is, that is a, a very interesting question. Other questions? Um, I have a question, maybe uh, look into it. I mean, those cancellations are very non-trivial. And when you see something like this, you would suspect like there might be some underlying symmetry reason. Is there something like this uh, forcing this cancellation I, 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 or just conspiratorial? I No, I agree with you, absolutely. I think it's diffeomorphism invariance, but I haven't been able to explicitly work through, you know, what you'd like then is to apply the ward identities of diffeomorphism invariance in the five-dimensional compactified case and show how that relates to couplings. To be honest, I ha we haven't been able to work that through yet, but my suspicion is uh, if we are clever, we should be able to see it that way. But I, I, I believe it's a manifest. And, there's another way that I know this. There's another way of thinking about this, by the way, that I'm, I'm, we're starting to explore more completely. Um, and this only works in the toroidal case. It doesn't work in RS. And that is toroidal compactification is just uncompactified five-dimensional theory where you restrict uh, the fifth component of the momentum onto a lattice of the toroidal, toroidally allowed momenta. And because of of KK momentum conservation, if you restrict the external states to have the momenta allowed by the lattice, at tree level, all of the internal states also lie on the lattice because they have to, they're just sums because momentum conservation is respected. Uh, verte KK, sorry, five dimensional, including discrete KK momentum conservation, mod N or 2N or whatever it is, is respected interaction by interaction. Um, and so this is the way that the uh, amplitudeology people would use five-dimensional amplitudes. They would compactify and they would, they would tell you, oh, it's because the five-dimensional theory, the explicit state, you know, the, in five dimensions, the scattering amplitude has dimensions of one over mass, the two to two scattering amplitude. So it's E squared over M Planck cubed. And uh, if you are clever, you can extract these results, they would say, from the uncompactified five-dimensional amplitude. And we've we started to work on that. I think it will work out. And they'll be able to look, for example, at the residues of the poles and figure out the different couplings. That's another way of getting at it. Uh, but in the end of the day, I think the answer to your question is it's a reflection of five-dimensional diffeomorphism invariance. Um, in the torus, it's pretty straightforward, and I think it can be worked out. In RS, I'd be curious what others say, but I, it's, it's a little more complicated there. Thank you. Okay, so let's now apply this to the case we were actually interested in, um, massive spin two scattering in the, in the randall sunder model. There are a number of significant um, complications just in the technical details. Uh, first of all, you need to perturb around the RS metric and here you run into a problem that's well known in uh, kluza klein compactifications, and that is that the radion mode uh, mixes non-trivially, if you're not careful, with the trace part of the tensor perturbation uh, in, in four dimensions, if you have a non-flat background. Uh, and, uh, and, and so this is a parameter, this is the reason for this sort of peculiar parameterization. Here is the uh, metric perturbation in four dimensions, the, the tensor perturbation in four dimensions that we're going to KK expand that will give us our Kaluza Klein uh, tower of states. Here is the radion, and again, we fix a gauge, so the radion is, uh, only has uh, uh, a dependence on the uh, 
uncompactified coordinates. There's only one state. And this peculiar form of the perturbation, we've cho chosen to write it this way, uh, gives you basically the Einstein frame uh, perturbation for H mu nu. That is, it, it undoes the mixing. It, it, we've written it in a, in a it, and this U, by the way, is this, is this combination of exponential. It turns out this combination um, leaves you with uh, quadratic canonical terms for the, for the radion and for the tensor perturbation. So that's one of the technical complications of doing um, uh, fluctuations around the, uh, the, the, uh, a, a non-flat background. Um, so again, what you, we expect the same sort of thing. We're going to get a, a, a massless spin two particle and a set of massive spin two KK states. And we're going to get a massless uh, radion. This really is, is the radion then. Uh, but there's no analog of KK momentum conservation anymore. And we'll see that reflected in the fact that we'll have many more couplings between uh, KK modes than we did in the case of a torus. So, you know, you just go through and you figure out what the appropriate KK wave functions are. You decompose all of your states. You plug it into the Einstein-Hilbert-Lagrange and you do the um, expansion. One thing to keep in mind is, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, Einstein-Hilbert action is a true derivative um, uh, a term. And so when you do the KK expansion, you end up getting two different kinds of couplings. You end up getting couplings that involve two ordinary uh, space derivatives, and you have couplings that involve uh, two y squared derivatives. Because of the, you know, the form of the metric we chose, you don't have any cross terms between them. But they count differently in terms of the way the radion couples to uh, the different kinds of uh, couplings. So you have to keep track of all of these different couplings that, uh, that can arise. But, but you know, in, in principle, it's straightforward. It's just uh, technically uh, complicated. So you get the, these kind of vertices. You get radion KK mode vertices. Uh, you get you know, three-point vertices and four-point vertices. When you do the KK decomposition, you can then get couplings between the radion and now the radion coupling can be off diagonal, it will turn out. It can be between KK mode M and KK mode N where those two are different. Uh, you in general have uh, couplings between all, you know, any three arbitrary KK modes, KM and N, or any four KK modes, KM, N, and L. Um, for the purposes of plotting things, we've chosen these parameterizations, but the, these parameters don't really matter. Um, it's uh, just the, it's, it's really the, the, the amplitude dependence that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on. So you expect the same sorts of, uh, you know, the kinematically, the diagrams have the same behavior. So the, the four point uh, coupling, say if we look at uh, elastic scattering of KK modes at level one, the four point coupling uh, will grow like uh, the, the, sorry, the, the contribution, the amplitude from the four point coupling will grow like energy to the 10th. The contribution from ST and U channel uh, contributions from each level N in general, you're gonna have to sum over all KK modes N. Uh, in, even at level one, each of these uh, contributions goes like energies of the tenth, and then you have contributions coming from the exchange of the radion that go like uh, energy to the sixth. And now our question is, what happens when you sum all of these together and you sum over all of the KK states? And this is a calculation you have to do. You set it up and you have to do it numerically. Uh, and what I'm going to show you now are numerical plots of the you know, the S to the t E to the 10th coefficient, the E to the 8th coefficient. On the next slides, I'll show you the E to the 6th and E to the 4th uh, contributions. And uh, uh, this is just the contact interaction alone. You see the contact interaction has a non-trivial, these units are arbitrary, but contact interaction has a non-trivial S to the 5th or E to the 10th growth. And now as you add more and more KK states, you see that this energy to the 10th contribution uh, vanish. This is actually, if you look at the scale here, it's changed by 20 orders of magnitude. Uh, and this is as a function of center of mass scattering angle. So again, you see that these cancellations that we saw in the toroidal case now occur in RS, at least for this energy of the 10th contribution, but they occur in a much more um, complicated way. They occur through the exchange of not just one level, but many, many levels of the KK tower. So let, let me pause for a second before talking about the other graphs, just to make sure that there aren't any questions or that the, the, the explanation was clear. 
No. So this is this energy to the eighth. Uh, and again, you see the same pattern. Uh, the, um, as you add more KK states, the, the energy of the eighth coefficient uh, vanishes. And when you finally get your programs working right and, uh, and you have the radion and everything diagonalized correctly, the contributions diagonalized correctly, here's the energy to the sixth. Um, and you'll see the radion is crucial. Here's the radion here. But with the radion, as you add more KK states, the, um, the coefficient of the energy of the sixth terms cancel. And here's energy to the fourth. And again, the radion is important here. And what I've, what I've, uh, uh, I've tried to argue, what I've shown you, is that these cancellations persist over all of phase space. And I th as I think uh, you can see, even when you, you know, in principle, uh, only Mathematica can do this, right? It can tell you that there's a non-trivial contribution at uh, one part in 10 to the 20. But it's, uh, it's still, in principle, there. And it's only, as, as, I'll, as I'll demonstrate, um, uh, in, in a minute, we have some analytic uh, understanding of why these cancellations occur. And we can show uh, why the, the, that the cancellations are exact. Uh, actually, in four out of, how do you count it? Three out of four of the cases, we can show the cancellation is exact um, uh, analytically. So um, I'm going to talk about those cancellations more in a second, but are there any questions before I go on? Right, so, so I, I've, I've shown you these cancellations uh, as you sum over all the KK towers. And again, very much unlike the case of the torus where all you needed was a few discrete states. Um, so the, the reason, and this will seem, I know, familiar to John, is that um, when you do these uh, wave function expansions for figuring out what the wave functions are, the, the, the mode expansion the, the differential equations satisfied by the wave functions of your modes, they satisfy a Sturm-Louisville problem, right? That with a, here's the weight function, or that tells you the orthogonality of the different states, uh, and, uh, and, and there's a non-trivial, uh, in, in this case, with warping, there's a non-trivial factor here as well. So when you actually look at the different types of couplings that appear, so here's a coupling between the radion and M and N, here's three point couplings of the different KK states, here's the four point couplings, here's what these, uh, the integrals that determine these couplings actually look like. And remember I told you there were A type couplings where uh, it, the, the A type couplings, the derivatives were on the uh, uncompactified dimensions. That means when you do the integral over the internal wave functions, there's no derivatives here in the overlap integral for the, that defines the coupling constants. Whereas in the B type couplings, there were derivatives uh, in the internal space. Those derivatives, when you do the KK expansion, act on the wave functions themselves. So here are the, and, and so you have to keep track of them, but here are the different types of couplings. And here's the radion coupling. And it's interesting that this radion coupling has a different uh, weight factor here than it does here. Um, this weight factor is what you would expect for orthogonality. It doesn't occur here, so the radion has very off-diagonal couplings in general. You can use integration by parts and the Sturm-Louisville problem that was defined on the previous page to show how these B-type couplings are related to the A-type couplings. So you can actually analytically relate the B and A-type couplings. Although we, we check these numerically as well, we work, first worked them out numerically, and then we realized that we could, we could, uh, we could combine them. You can plug those relations in and you can do just a general expansion to compute what, is the, what are the different uh, coefficients in the scattering amplitude that, that, um, that uh, grow with different energies. And I suspect John will find these interesting. If you look at the energy of the fifth coupling, this is the combination. Once you've related the A and B type couplings to one another, these are the relations that you find uh, that is, the coefficient of the, of the energy of the tenth term turns out to be proportional to this linear combination, or this, this combination, rather, of coupling constants. So if this vanishes, which we will argue uh, is true on the next slide, then you know that the energy to the tenth contribution vanishes once you sum over all KK states. This one will also, I think, be familiar to John. This one is the, uh, the same kind of thing for the energy to the eighth growth. You'll notice you know, the angular dependencies are different, but this is the overall coefficient that multiplies the energy to the eighth contribution. Um, the first one is true by completeness of the Sturm-Louisville problem. 
Uh, and so once you, the, the J states are a complete set of states with respect to the appropriate weight functions. And so you plug in a complete set of states and completeness will tell you that this is true once you sum over all KK states. So the order S to the fifth or energy to the 10th sum rule is exactly satisfied and we can show that analytically in RS once you sum over all KK states. So there's a different question of numerically how many you need and I'll address that later. But at least we know that in principle, uh, the energy to the 10th mode cancels exactly. There's an additional contribution that you can uh, do here. If you plug that in, you find this completeness relation ends up, if you use completeness, you can show that the energy to the eighth contribution also cancels. And um, these are exactly the same relations that John Chaba and Christoph and uh, Luigi, I believe is his name. Tan John, am I right? <laughs> um, found yeah. in in uh, Yang Mills in the in in Higgs -less models. When they they were asking a a similar kind of a question, could you take uh, an extra dimensional Yang Mills theory, adjust the uh, on an interval, say, uh, adjust the boundary conditions, maintain the fact that you had a Stern Louisville problem, and get cancellation of the the energy the fourth and the energy squared growth, and they found that was true as long as the the wave function associated with, in that case, the Yang-Mills KK states satisfied these, and they noted that it was true whenever those states satisfied the appropriate stern weevil problem. And so we see that um, we've reproduced that in a different case here now for energy to the 10th and energy to the 8th in uh, gravitational theory. We still have to talk about energy to the 6th and energy to the 4th, which I'll do on the next, uh, next couple of slides, but um, are there any, any questions about that? So at energy cubed, um, the situation changes because as I argue, there's an additional state here, the radion that you need to include. And you can, uh, you can express the uh, leading energy to the sixth contribution turns out to be um, proportional to this combination of uh, coupling constants. And this vanishing can be viewed as a relationship between the radion coupling and the, the KK graviton mode couplings. This is the one relation we've not been able to prove analytically. And I know this is, you know, for most of us, right? You have a relation, you know it's true, you've, you've checked it on Mathematica to absurd precision. It's like waving a red flag, right? You ought to be able to prove it, but we've not been able to find an analytic proof of this relationship. We've checked it numerically, uh, as I say, to absurd precision. Uh, it, it must be true. And perhaps the key is, uh, related to the question that was related before. If we were clever enough to understand the worded entities of diffeomorphism invariance in this case, uh, and we have to figure out exactly what that means, including the uh, appropriate boundaries, you know, the contribution, potential contributions from the boundaries, um, we might be able to relate the radion coupling to the KK couplings. I, we just haven't found any, um, we haven't been able to find it yet. But we, we uh, as I, I've shown you the numerical evidence, and we check this as a coupling constant uh, relation to so this. Uh, this does appear to be the case in RS, which is why the energy to the sixth growth does cancel. Energy squared, um, this is the, the coefficient that would have to vanish. Uh, one peculiar thing is it turns out that the, the combination of a radion and massless graviton couplings that appear at energy of the fourth is exactly the same linear combination that appeared at energy of the sixth. Again, something that there ought to be a good explanation for, but I don't have a good physics explanation for it. What that does mean is if we assume the energy to the sixth sum rule is correct, I can rewrite this one and I can rewrite it by eliminating the radion coupling. And this gives us an order, uh, so the order S squared and order S cubed together gives us this relationship. This relationship is going to be interesting to answer Marcus's question uh, in, a, in a few slides. But this is a relation entirely among the couplings and the masses of the uh, KK modes. And this one we can prove directly from the stern louisville problem. So of the four, to summarize, of the four relations that have to be true for cancellation of the bad high energy growth in massive spin two scattering in the Randall-Sundrum model, we can prove three out of four. Uh, and the, the fourth one we have strong uh, numerical evidence for, and we believe it to be true. We just have no analytic uh, proof. So um, any, any questions about, about that? 
So I'll wrap up here in a second with just a few applications. Up to now, I have focused entirely on the scattering, elastic scattering of the helicity zero state. Uh, but there are, of course, 25 different possible incoming polarizations and 25 possible outgoing polarizations. A lot of them are related by crossing and other symmetries, but I've just laid it out here as a matrix. If you ask what is the, um, before applying any of the sum rules, diagram by diagram, what is the fastest high energy growth you could have in all possible helicity combinations as energy to what power? Here's uh, zero, zero goes to zero, zero. That goes like, that has contributions that go like energy to the 10th. And as expected, that's the worst possible helicity combination. Here's the dependence before applying any sum rules for all other combinations. And not surprisingly, the massless spin, you know, the, the helicity two, helicity two, the helicity two, helicity two is perfectly well behaved. It just goes like energy, uh, energy squared. Now, what we're going to do is for all of these scattering options, there aren't, I forget exactly how many independent ones, but, you know, if you apply the sum rules to those amplitudes, this is what you get. The, uh, the helicity zero sum rules, when applied to uh, all of these, also tame all the bad high energy growth in all helicity combinations. And you now see uniformly that the, the worst high energy growth is, in, is like energy squared uh, anywhere, which is exactly what you knew had to happen um, uh, from the uncompactified theory. So we were able to explicitly demonstrate that. So the just to, to emphasize, there aren't any additional sum rules, at least uh, for, for this process. Uh, it's sufficient to ensure all elastic matrix element grow uh, like energy E squared at, at most. Um, you can ask, you know, how many, um, what is the relative size, for example? Uh, how, many, how many KK states do you need to include in order to see these cancellations occur? Uh, this is a combination 1, 4 to 2, 3. It's kind of an interesting combination because um, it doesn't have a massless graviton contri contribute in the toroidal limit because there's no uh, spin, spin uh, sorry, KK momentum 0 doesn't contribute in the intermediate state. This is just uh, the scattering amplitude at some fixed angle, and you can see the contributions from the, 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 uh, the, the energy squared. So you can see it stabilizes at less than 10 kK modes. And by the time you've gotten to 10 kK modes, all of the other contributions uh, are rather small. Uh, this is for uh, KRC equals 10, arguably a phenomenologically interesting uh, case in RS but you know, one that's highly warped in some sense. This is KRC equals 0.1, because after all, formally in the limit KRC goes to zero, you should be able to recover, and, and we've been able to recover the toroidal limits. And you can start to see that as you get to small values of KRC, you reproduce some, at, 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 at KRC equals zero, you have to reproduce the toroidal momentum sum rules, and you can start to see this sort of stair-step pattern uh, showing that, that you're, you're, you're maybe getting in the neighborhood. But what, what I think is kind of interesting and remarkable is you don't see, other than that, that kind of stair-step pattern, you don't see any huge uh, qualitative difference between KRC is 10 and 0.1. It looks like the toro uh, toroidal case uh, flat is really, um, uh, a, 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 I wouldn't say singular, but, but really a very different limit than the, than the, than the warped case and, and with any warping. Uh, you can ask, you know, how many terms do you need in order to get an accurate result? Uh, this is if you are doing a center of mass scattering, you know, doing one one to one one elastic scattering at a center of mass scattering uh, energy of ten times the uh, the kk mass of uh, of the first state, and basically uh, the black line here is the full calculation, including all contributions. And here we've separated out. And you'll see that the energy to the tenth contribution dominates until the full con until the sum is becomes a good approximation, a reasonably good approximation to the full result. And here at KRC equals 0.1, you need about three or four states at this energy. At KRC equals 10, you need more like five or six six states to get an accurate scattering amplitude. Um, while we were finishing this work, uh, Bonificio and Hinterbeckler, and this is uh, a, a 
did something related, um, and that's the, their paper there. They, they derived identical sum rules in two ways. They just did it purely from the scattering amplitudes directly. Uh, and they also proved the sum rules uh, that I that I showed you for Ricci flat compact spaces. I, I remind you that Ricci flat means R equals zero, and uh, and R S is not Ricci flat. Um, so they and and so you know we have independent confirmation that the sum rules we derived are uh, are the, are the right ones. Uh, but they also realized that combination of the s cubed and s squared sum rules that I discussed has a very interesting consequence that bears on the uh, question that. Um, that uh, Marcus answered. If I if I put these together with the order s to the fourth sum rule, you can rewrite it this way. And suppose you are interested in you let n equals one. You're interested in one one goes to one one. You sum over all states j. Well, if you look at this, if 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 you if you define n equals one to be your lowest non-zero mass state, the zero mass state doesn't contribute to this sum. Then for all j, mj squared is greater than m1 squared. So this term is always positive, and this term is always positive. In order for the sum to be non-trivial, in order for these couplings to be non-trivial, and for the sum to be zero, it must be that this term is negative for some, uh, for some region. And so you, you must have a state, you must have the next lightest state is bounded by twice the mass of the first one. So Marcus, I hope this, this addresses your question, right? You might, or, or, or John, you probably were thinking this, right? For in the Higgs list case, what was interesting was you showed that you were able to get to, to adjust things so that there was one state that was anomalously light and then you had a KK tower with roughly even, spa even spacing. What this shows is that in the gravitational case, you can't do that. In the gravitational case, uh, first of all, you need the spin, the, 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 um, um, the, the spin zero, the massless graviton, but even beyond the massless graviton, you can't adjust your KK spectrum to have large spacing between uh, the massive states. In particular, you, you can only get you, you, the, the upper bound uh, on the next highest state. If M1 is your lightest massive state, the next highest state can't have a mass greater than twice the mass of the first one. And actually, if you think about it, this is exactly what happens in the toroidal limit. In the toroidal limit, M2 is exactly 2M1. And uh, you can check, although it's not obvious, when you solve the Kluza-Klein um, problem for the warp case, M2 is always less than twice M1. So this is a big difference between the Yang-Mills case and the uh, spin two case. How does it so, um, I, sorry, sorry, how does it cancel if M two is two M one? Then there's one term. Everything zero. zero. Oh, it everything. turns out everything is everything turns out to be zero. This one cancels for the lowest one. This one cancels for the next one, and everything else is zero because of KK momentum conservation. Thanks. Can I just ask yep. also a question? Um, so yeah, yeah. So th yeah, this is this is interesting. I, I think I was actually sort of interested in a slightly different thing, which is um, you know imagine we are willing to throw away extra dimensions, just use them for some sort of inspiration. Then it looked like in the toroidal case, because you only had a uh, you, you only had a few additional states coming in, right? Uh, maybe you have more freedom there. I mean, that was my question. So you're not going to get this from an extra dimension, but if you were just willing to throw in a single additional spin two, right. et cetera, you know, and you were trying to raise the cutoff, of course, now you've added an additional spin two. So you're, you're playing whack-a-mole and now you have to worry about its couple, it, its cutoff. But the question is whether by playing that game, you could try to raise the, how far you can go in raising the, the, the cutoff without adding too many light states. Did you, did you think about that? Right. Um, I think this answers the question, but in a slightly different way, right? I mean, if you go back to what Howard, Nima, and Matt showed, that the cutoff was of order, uh, you know, M Planck times the mass of your state to the uh, mass of the state to the fourth, the whole thing to the fifth, one fifth power. What that shows you is that parametrically, uh, if little m, if the mass of your state is less than m Planck, you never get uh, a uh, uh, you never get a cutoff that's proportional to m Planck. It's always parametrically by powers less than m Planck. Uh, 
The same thing is true here, because even though if you have M1, what you've shown is M2 can't be more than twice M1, and therefore the cutoff is still proportional to the same dimensional quantity in M Planck and M, right? Yeah, yeah, so, I, so. Yeah, but I, I, I get that. I, I understand. I'm, I'm, I, uh, you know, I mean, I, I appreciate this very much, but, but you could still, it still might be interesting to ask whether you can put the extra modes closer to that cutoff, this three halves cutoff, yeah. whatever. See here, the next state is coming in uh, at order M, which is you know, right. your IR scale. The biggest cutoff could be, is still parametrically much larger than that, right? It's this, okay. you know. I think you're asking, can you scale. imagine a, a KK well, K tower and couplings? To, yeah, you, yeah, you're never gonna do better than that, right? You're never gonna do better than, the, than that massive graviton thing, presumably, but you can see how close you can get. Can you put a state, yeah. can you put the, the, the spin two state near parametrically at their cutoff, and then mm -hmm. you do any better, what, you know, what happens? Yeah. That was no, uh, no I, we haven't investigated that completely. You, you, I, uh, I, I, if I, I guess what I, the way I would say, what I think I hear you saying is, uh, you know, Matt and company argued you couldn't do better than a dependence on little m to the four fifths, whereas this is a dependence on little m. And uh, can you exploit that difference? And no, we haven't investigated that uh, uh, completely. Okay, thanks. Uh, so that's that's pretty much uh, um, uh, what what I what I had to say. Um, uh, we've we've looked, of course, you know, the interesting question phenomenologically is what happens when you add matter. Uh, we've shown that you can generalize this to bulk and brain localized scalars, and I'm convinced I'm sure it'll happen for for vectors and fermions too. That we haven't finished the calculations. There's a lot that remains to be explored, like getting back to the original question. And for example, the practical question, if you're interested, for example, in a relic density calculation, how do you appropriately model for a, 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 you know, a gravitational portal model? How do you appropriately model the dark matter um, uh, density and scattering amplitudes? And, and that's something we still have to, uh, have to get back to. So that's, uh, that's what I had to say. I'm sorry, I, I went over a little. That's that's great. Let's thank the speaker. And uh, any other questions? So we'll have a question period, and then we'll have after question period an informal chat period. So questions. Sure. I have All a the question. questions that you don't want to be recorded, right? We can ask them after <laughs> in the informal period. So I think thinking, thinking okay. about the effective field theory. Uh, I could integrate out all the higher KK modes, keep one massive mode, and there's some counter term I get from integrating those out to match the calculations. Mm -hmm. And now we know the sum rules there, so we don't you don't have to know that you don't have to know what the spectrum is. You just know that matching the calculations, the counter terms are adjusted, so you just cancel all those higher powers of energy in the scattering. <coughs> Mm -hmm. So have you, is there, do you know how to write down what the effective theory is with those counter terms so that you just have a single no. state? I hear what you're saying. No, I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at it that way. Uh, Interesting question. Mm -hmm. Presumably the, it's still suppressed by some scale of order, the, the mass. Right, right. It won't be suppressed by the Planck scale. Right. Um, I have a question. Um, in uh, massive uh, graviton scattering, uh, how would including loops, graviton loops, uh, affect the growth? Would that make it worse or make it the same? Uh, it could make it worse, um, just like in uh, in the chiral Lagrangian, where uh, you know that the elastic scattering goes like energy squared, and then uh, loops require counter terms that go like energy to the fourth, uh, and you know that they're there because the imaginary parts of those loops uh, uh, are, are determined. Uh, so you would expect it's a non-normalizable theory, so uh, you would expect the same kind of behavior. Uh, the issue is what's the power counting that suppresses that behavior?
And that power counting, I think, is set by the tree level counting. Um, but, but in general, it will, it will get worse and worse order by order. OK, any other questions? In the last uh, sentence, you said if you want to connect the results more than um, to the dology mm -hmm. and double copy, what do you think about this direction? So I think in the toroidal case, it's actually pretty straightforward uh, because of what I told you, that I think you can view the toroidal calculation as a calculation in, in a flat five-dimensional non-compact space where you restrict the momentum of your states to have particular discrete values in the fifth in the extra coordinate and everything and because because you have uh because in the toroidal case you have kk momentum conservation even a discrete version of that that's sufficient to uh to make everything consistent um and there i think the double copy will just work because the double copy are you familiar with what the double copy says no, no, not quite. Uh, so uh, if you decompose uh, tree level, uh, uh, say gluon gluon to gluon gluon elastic scattering, and you do it, you decompose it into cyclic color sums, then each term in the amplitude looks like a cyclic color sum times a kinematic factor. And the amazing thing is that kinematic factor squared, if you just were to take it, it turns out to be the same um, kinematic factor as in gravity. And so okay. in some sense, a double copy of a gauge theory looks like a gravitational scattering amplitude. And that does work in, that's known to work in a flat space in any number of dimensions. And so I expect the five dimensional toroidal case will go through uh, completely. Um, but, but RS is different because um, you have no, as you, as you saw explicitly from the fact that you have an infinite number of couplings, you don't have any discrete KK conservation um, I don't know how to, like, I, I need to somehow think about RS in some way that I expand it so I have some kind of a symmetry I can use and I, I don't see one at the moment. Uh, so I, I think RS is just different. But, I, you know, on the one hand, I'd like to believe that the, that, the, that, the, that the cutoff is a UV property of the theory that shouldn't matter, it shouldn't matter about the, that, and that somehow compactification is an IR property of the theory. Um, but okay. it's non-trivial. <laughs> I just, right, when you actually compute it it, 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 it all gets mixed up. Yeah, but I'm thinking it's possible to connect with this Anshao language thing you read down. Oh, that's, that's what I mean. That, that, it's the Anshao language that allows you to write down the graviton scattering amplitude in any number of dimensions and the, yeah. and the yang mill scattering amplitude and show that the relationship holds. So yes. Okay. Okay, if there's no more official questions, let's thank Sager again. Turn on your mics to clap.